I'm going to present, uh, talk a little bit about the Myriad decision, some of its aftermath, uh, some of the foreshadowing of Myriad, try to give it some context, and then also, as I sort of discuss, or probably would be a good header, uh, why nobody is happy with the Myriad decision. Yeah. <laughs> Except maybe Myriad, I run. But, uh, uh, but uh, kind of demarcate the reasons for confusion. I have the, the title of Demarcating Nature because that seems to be what, when I first read the opinion, I guess it's just a year ago, or a little over a year ago, um, it read like, uh, I think Kara may have mentioned this, it's read like a bio, you know, biochemistry for dummies book or something. Uh, it was a very <coughs> odd opinion because there was very little law in it. And then you had this concurrence that I'll discuss from Justice Scalia suggesting that, well, I don't really believe in this opinion but I'll just sign on with the result, which is a very <laughs> odd thing for any uh, justice to do at that level. But yeah, I'll talk about that some well. Uh, but my basic uh, bottom line in this case, uh, in, in this discussion, is that the whole idea of demarcating nature is just kind of silly. Uh, and that's sort of what's going on, in at least in one of the exceptions to the uh, uh, patentable subject matter uh, that, that I'll go into. Um, the court seems to have this notion that there is this pristine area, I don't know which century we can associate this with, that is sort of free from any human intervention, uh, and that area has to be sort of be, uh, be kept safe from patent law, which is really not what I think about as the purpose of patentable subject matter. I mean, I don't, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about some of the influences and background to the, the, to the ideas in this, in this paper and presentation, uh, but I think uh, patentable subject matter is largely this threshold inquiry. It really, at some level, uh, if you just think about it administratively, is trying to figure out what can this patent office do <laughs> versus other agencies. So there is sort of a territorial aspect, again, to use uh, kind of landed metaphors, which I don't totally like, uh, but there is this aspect of just what is the sovereignty of this particular agency, the patent office, to distinguish between patentable subject matter and trademark subject matter or copyright subject matters, to take kind of an old joke uh, from from US jurisdiction, you know, you won't go to the patent office to fix a parking ticket. That's just simply not what they do, uh, but there's only certain areas, and so that's what we're trying to define. But those types of boundary issues are the ones that often get the most controversial. You know, whether you're thinking about uh, intellectual property or you're thinking about litigation. Uh, Matthew talked about uh, a lot of the litigation reforms, and a lot of them are trying to, at the threshold, decide when a particular lawsuit is actually of merit and one that is just simply frivolous. Uh, and that, of course, creates a whole range of questions uh, in terms of civil litigation, uh, who has access to courts, what rights get vindicated, and so forth. And those also get stirred up in the area uh, of patentable subject matter. But that is sort of the inquiry, right? Uh, if we want to turn it into a broader question of saying, this area is just simply not patentable, I do start with the presumption that's really a, a question for the political bodies. Uh, that's a question for the legislature, and the courts may have very little room to do with that. And I think Myriad may be an example of that, uh, where the courts maybe have tried to carve out uh, something, and, uh, but really have just sort of revealed sort of the inadequacy of the courts to deal with this patentable subject matter issue. So that's sort of the, the, broad, uh, the broad picture, uh, and that's sort of maybe where I'm, I'm, I'm heading. There are nuances there. I can see what the reactions might be to what I've just said, uh, but that is sort of the broad, you know, kind of spectrum. It may be a very U.S.-centric uh, spectrum, but uh, I think Kara was uh, asking yesterday about Indian patent law in the 1970s. Uh, the exceptions that were carved out there were, to use it for lack of a better term, political. I mean, they were done by the legislative branches rather than by the judicial branches, uh, with definite policy consideration and deliberation in mind. Uh, in a way that I don't think courts could do. Courts have been very interesting, for example, to take the India case uh, in the Novartis decision in terms of looking at some of the applications of uh, concepts of non-obviousness or inventive step. But in terms of the broader questions about where the law should go in terms of demarcating different areas, I'm not quite sure if the court is, is as adequate. And so this will also signal uh, kind of the end of my talk. So, uh, you know, everybody's wondering, especially, you know, the hour and a half, which I, I love the time. I, 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 I'm very good at filling a vacuum, uh, and so uh, I'll definitely do that here a little bit. Not that this is a vacuum, but you know, I've got a lot of time here that I've been granted me. But, um, and so you'll know when I'm over when I start talking about competition policy, because there was a case uh, that was decided a few weeks after the Myriad decision by the U.S. Supreme Court called FTC versus Actavis, which also had a very interesting view about the role of patent law, uh, especially the relationship between patent law and competition law. 
And I think in our very first uh, presentation uh, yesterday, Bronwyn talked about how in the pharmaceutical sector, and I don't know, if, I, mean, I think this is sort of the rhetoric, this may be the policy that, you know, FDA regulation, safety regulation, and robust patent systems. But there's always a question about what a robust patent system means, right? And so this is something that I think the Myriad case and also the Octavius case uh, gets us to think about. So I've sort of given you an overview of where I'm coming from, and then also a signal about when you know I'm almost done, uh, so you can breathe a sigh of relief or, or, or whatnot. But feel free to, uh, to interrupt and ask uh, any questions as I, as I proceed, and um, that will that'll work very well uh, uh, in, in, my, in my plans. So in terms of the broader background, right, I guess I'm, I should talk a little bit about that, uh, since you may not be familiar with my work in terms of this idea of demarcating nature. Um, I think there are kind of two things that inform me in terms of just broader uh, influences, people I've interacted with, people whose work I've, I've read. Uh, one is Dennis Patterson's Law and Truth. So Barris mentioned, uh, I think you described this sort of a 19th century notion of law as sort of the judges or the law, the lawmaker uh, looking for uh, you know, the right answer. Uh, I'll, I'll, give that an, I'll give that conception of the truth within the 20th century or maybe the 21st century. What is just the right result? It may not be universally true, but it's sort of the right result. And so the law and truth by Dennis Patterson, uh, one aspect of this is where, where he tries to really kind of take apart this idea of postmodernism. And what do we mean by postmodernism in the law? And I've, I've always found his take on postmodernism fairly helpful uh, because he recognizes that postmodernism's moves usually involve taking kind of standard dichotomies, which we may associate with modernism, and then trying to twist them a little bit. And so one of the uh, modernism, one of the notions, of course, first is tradition and modern is one of those dichotomies. There's also things like, especially in IP, oral versus written. Again, those things that we think about maybe as indicators of modernist thinking, postmodernism tries to, to twist. Even find the excluded middle, or to recognize that that demarcation itself has, has, has problems. And so the one that's, I think, relevant, of course, for Myriad that, that Dennis Patterson talks about is nature versus culture. You know, whether that particular distinction <coughs> is helpful, whether that distinction, which as I think does happen in the Myriad case, just masks some political decision, or even maybe mask, uh, in this case maybe Justice Scalia is, is uh, dishearteningly honest, as he is wont to be, <laughs> that you know, the judges really don't know how to answer this question. So they need to come up with just an answer, <laughs> and this is the answer that they've sort of managed to say. Here's the rule, here's the application, voila, we've done our job. So I'll, I'll take that apart a little bit, but the nature-culture distinction, I think, is also relevant for when we're thinking about patentable subject matter and why myriad just may be a frustrating opinion, uh, because it may be very difficult to isolate or identify something that is of nature that is distinct from what we might view as cultural or, or human, uh, whatever the, the, the oppositional point might be. Uh, and so you see this a little bit even in the distinction that the court makes about uh, the, three, the three exclusions from patentable subject matter. Uh, laws of nature, abstract idea, and then it's sometimes referred to as natural phenomenon, sometimes referred to as products of nature. And it's not quite clear. There's a distinction between the two, but they're sort of talked about in the same way. And uh, I'll give you a little bit about background of patentable subject. I'm about to look forward a little bit. I think there have been some reference to the cases. In the recent Alice versus CLS Bank case, the court seems to offer a coherent approach to patentable subject matter that's based upon identifying one of the exclusions and then asking in step two whether there's some sort of application uh, of that exclusion or is it just simply uh, a an attempt to patent the exclusion itself in a way that has no invention and it may be preemptive, you know, maybe blocking others. Right? That seems to be the methodology uh, from this less than one month of decision. <laughs> Uh, that the court offered to us. But I mention it here because it seems like in, in the, that opinion that they have a methodology that would apply to laws of nature and abstract ideas. It's not completely clear where natural phenomenon come in. Uh, because in natural phenomenon, you're thinking about, uh, to use the language from the Patent Act in the US, a composition of matter. And we're asking when that composition of matter is somehow man-made and non-natural, and when is it natural? And it's not quite completely clear to me, at least, how that two-step approach in Alice would apply uh, to a composition of matter claim. 
uh, you know, to what extent or what degree of inventiveness. And I'll, I'll play with that a little bit in, in, a, in a latter part of my talk when I look at this kind of distinction between invention and discovery that sort of permeates the discussion, but also is not very helpful in terms of understanding uh, natural phenomena. And so there is this kind of issue about natural phenomena uh, that is sort of hanging over the, uh, the, the opinions, even though we've had four opinions. We've had the Bilski case in 2010, Mayo versus Prometheus in 2012, Myriad last year, and then Alice. And you know, the, the point is, you know, how do you square you know, all these various circles? Uh, and they are kind of circular, some of these opinions uh, that the court has offered us. Uh, but this natural phenomenon is sort of hovering uh, over this distinction. And some lower courts have recognized that. I mean, I'll look at one post-Myriad case, we discuss it briefly, uh, where the district court says, well, natural phenomena are, are different than these two others and have a different approach. And I would argue that's sort of an open question after Alice as to how natural phenomena slash products of nature, whatever that exception is, uh, are treated. So that's reflecting kind of this law and truth influence. I mean, this sort of, the myriad is maybe high postmodernism in some ways, uh, where the court is, you know, if you just look at it on the surface, they seem to be saying, okay, nature, culture, we'll just have that divide. Nature, synthetic, nature, man-made. But at the same time, you've got, I think, again, Scalia very honestly saying, uh, don't look behind the curtain, right? Uh, just simply take what we've done, and this is the result, but there's no belief that it hasn't been. I'll, I'll explore that a little bit more. And so the other, the, the other influence is my background uh, as, as a PhD economist, looking at uh, transactions and thinking about the commercialization aspect of IP and how this actually works in practice, especially as, as Barris mentioned, some of the competition law issues. And so I come at this thinking about uh, 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 a Coasean view, not necessarily the view that Ronald Coase, if you took him literally, but sort of the whole idea that, that the legal system, legal rights are a construct that are meant to somehow, uh, Coase would say, kind of facilitate transactions, but that's a little bit simplistic. It really is about facilitating different types of organizations. And so this is where the robustness of Coase, I think, really comes into play, especially with those who take more of a kind of a socioeconomic or a kind of a hybrid approach to thinking about the economic issues, which I think is appropriate. Sometimes referred to as maybe institutional economics or neo-institutional economics. Um, and so this is what is also very interesting in the patentable subject matter debate, because we're asking at the threshold, should some rights be created, and what are the nature of those rights, right? So one way to think about the patentable subject matter debate, as I mentioned, is sort of a threshold issue. What's, what's on the patent side in terms of the system of rights we create? What's on the copyright side? What's on the trademark side? But of course, one of the, one of the underlying themes, and this is something I, I read about, is that the, the choice some ways is between patent and trade secret. And how do we draw that line in terms of the set of organizations and institutions? And the broader issue then that comes into play is not just simply what those substantive rights are, but how those rights are determined and how they would play out. And so you know, one aspect of, of the Coastian approach that's very interesting is that we think about markets as just simply constructs. There's nothing natural about the market. I mean, we have a lot of very interesting biological metaphors, but if you go back you know, to Adam Smith, Adam Smith you know, is writing against folks like, not writing against, but in the background of you know, largely biological thinking of, of the way uh, economies work. So the famous case of the famous uh, treatise on the fable of the bees by Baron de Mandeville, you know, which is trying to, to, to capture the organization of human activity and economic activity in terms of analogies. Uh, to, uh, to, to the animal kingdom and the animal world. And so this is kind of, again, nature versus culture, you know, trying to look at the world and see how other, uh, other entities organize their activity, uh, and then trying to make some sort of step, right? So this is kind of the, the 17th century, 18th century notion that I think Coase then comes into play, and especially when you're thinking about Coastianism more broadly, is then thinking not only about what types of organizations you have, but how you decide what organizations you have. And then how you think about organizations, not just simply and statically, but in, in an evolutionary or dynamic sort of way. And so if you think about kind of the uh, uh, overlap between economics and biology, you've got Baron de Mandeville in the, uh, in the 18th century. You've got some aspect of this in Smith, but I think Smith was taking more of a, a sociological approach. And then when you look at sort of the 19th century, uh, you see you know, the development of evolutionary biology and then some overlap, especially with 
uh, with social Darwinism between economics and biology merging uh, in that role. Alfred Marshall, uh, often credited with uh, the development of sort of modern economic concepts that are taught in the, uh, the basic economics course, was a physician, right? And so his background was also thinking about uh, the biology and so forth. And so when I look at Coase, Coase is not necessarily taking that nature versus uh, um, uh, uh, culture type distinction. He's recognizing that it's a broad question of how you organize society. And that organization of society is working in a particular context, right? And how do you take account of that uh, in terms of how you construct your markets and also you know, governments, states, other types of institutions, right? I often make the mistake of sometimes talking about markets and other institutions as if the other institutions are an afterthought. Uh, but they're not meant to be, right? This is just simply kind of the, the starting point, so I'll be very kind of flexible and, and broad. So that's, that's largely the background, right? This is kind of uber level uh, general principles in terms of what I'm thinking about. Law and truth, kind of nature versus culture, that distinction is not uh, a, a, a solid distinction. And then how do we do the, and so one way to kind of think about these two parts is, you know, I, I come at this as a social constructivist, but as a social constructivist, I also kind of recognize that there's a problem with social construction that anything goes. I think there is sort of either the critique of social construction, but also people who operate within that tradition seem to take a fairly strong relativist, anything goes of view. But I think when you're dealing with social construction, the real question is, how do you construct things, right? Uh, and that how question has both a, a normative dimension, but also a technical and positive dimension, not that you can demarcate those, those neatly. And so my, my perfect example of, of, of analogy, to use that here of social construction, is architecture, right? A building is socially constructed, but we certainly hope that not anything goes with buildings, right? And so the ways in which the buildings construct have aspects of physical law, they have aspects of social convention, they have all sorts of uh, issues that come up in that, and that's the way we should approach law. Now, I don't know if that's a 19th century notion of law or what, I mean, you can find roots of this and lots, and that would be worth exploring for those who are interested. But, you know, but that's the, that's the broader, uh, broader dimension of, of what I'm gonna talk about, uh, and hopefully it gives you some sort of frame uh, for, you know, if, if something isn't clear, that's the frame that it's sort of focusing on. So within that framework, uh, what I thought I would do then is give you uh, sort of an account of Myriad, put it into context, talk about cases that have come up after Myriad, and then uh, end with uh, several reasons for the confusion. And the reasons for the confusion in part have to do with you know, how do you deal with science and the law, that's very clear in Scalia's uh, uh, concurrence and other questions, issues about political economy, uh, in terms of determining patentable subject matter and, and, and how the courts work within that political economy. Uh, this notion of invention versus discovery and how it relates to concepts of incentives and intellectual property. And then I'll talk about uh, sort of the broader role of patent law when we're thinking about competition and market construction issues and how this notion of inventive concept and preemption uh, fits into those. And that's gonna be the, 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 the capstone where I look at the connection between of the court's discussion in Myriad, and then the published opinion a few weeks later uh, in FTC versus Actavis. So I think we all have you know, a general notion of what Myriad is about. I mean, Myriad, uh, the court seems to say, if there's any moment of clarity, that isolated DNA sequences are not patentable subject matter, but synthetic uh, DNA sequences could be if they meet the other requirements. I think everybody sort of agrees that seems to be what the court is saying. Uh, the real question is why is it saying that? How did it reach that result? And, and what are the mechanisms for reaching that result? Part of this, uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the background for how the court reaches this result, is this exclusion for natural phenomena. And so again, the case that gets cited is the Diamond versus Chakravarti case from 1980, which again was a composition of matter case. And the question is whether a recombinant uh, bacteria would be considered a, a composition of matter under uh, US patent law. Uh, that was decided in 1980, and as we've referred to a number of times, about two decades later, the Canadian Supreme Court looking at Canadian uh, patent law and, and looking at not just simply a single cellular organism, but a multicellular organism said, no, that would not be patentable subject matter. But Diamond versus Chocolate really takes a very broad view of patentable subject matter 
with the three exceptions that I mentioned, abstract idea of laws of nature and natural phenomenon. Uh, and if you look at Diamond versus Chakravarti, I guess that's often cited as the source of those three exceptions. But of course it's not. I mean, you, you, the, those exceptions go back uh, certainly with natural phenomena, at least to the 19th century, abstract ideas you see in various forms as an exception uh, in the 19th century, as well as uh, the, the notion of laws of nature not being patentable. So you have those three exceptions, but they were announced in Diamond versus Chakravarti against a broader principle that patent law could apply to anything uh, that's made, that's constructed under the sun, right? Uh, so at least it's, it's limited to our galaxy. So that's good. Uh, but in any case, um, you have that sort of very broad holding, and the result uh, that you see uh, in 1980 is in 1982 you have the court then uh, also, excuse me, Congress creating the Federal Circuit, which then takes this sort of broad precedent and then applies it to all the emerging technologies that come up in the late 80s and the 90s and so forth, and then creates a fairly broad swath. So you have the, the State Street Bank case in 1997, it's not clear whether that overruled precedent or just simply applied it, but the view in that case is that the, the Federal Circuit gave uh, its blessing to business method patents. And then you had a series of cases, uh, such as in Ray Allipat and other cases that were decided by the Federal Circuit having to do with software patents. And so uh, you sort of had a plethora of, 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 of expansion of the court's jurisdiction in 1980. You have the specialized court that's created with at least the, the, uh, uh, the marching orders to you know, try to protect and save the US patent system. And then you had the breakthrough in technologies. So I mean, the perfect storm metaphor gets misused a lot. But maybe at least you had the right set of ingredients, uh, both in terms of looking at the activism and the review of, by scholars, as well as practitioners who then had to deal with all of these patents and figure out you know, what's infringing, when are we going to be violators, and so forth, what patents we can get, that I think in the late 1990s and 2000s led to a reconsideration, first in the patent office. And this is sort of interesting, because I have you know, uh, patent attorneys in my family. I kept hearing, like, you know, 2002, 2003, we're getting all these rejections from the patent office for 101. So what happens? Probably not a big deal being the typical clueless academic. I mean, anything under the sun, don't, remember, don't worry about it. But, uh, uh, but you have this kind of inkling of rejections, and then you had the cases going up to the Federal Circuit, roughly around 2003, 2004, uh, you know, reviewing these rejections, right? And the, some, some of them were coming as rejection of the patent office, some of them were coming as uh, uh, patent validity uh, defenses in patent infringement cases. And so this gives rise to the, I guess, the, um, the tetralogy of cases now. And this is, I mean, at some point when Bilski was, was, grant, was reviewed by the court in 2010, the view then was maybe this is a one-off. I think uh, Professor Pam Samuelson predicted in 2010 that Bilski would just be the start of a trilogy where the court would then maybe look at a, a business method patent case like Zimbilski, and then maybe a software case, and then something from, uh, from biotechnology. But it didn't really work out all that neatly, but there were more cases. I guess if you're trying to think about the logic, Bilski dealt with the exception of abstract ideas. Mayo versus Prometheus dealt with the exception for law of nature. And then Myriad dealt with the exception for, uh, for a natural phenomenon, which is a nice trinity of cases. And even though you know, we try to sort out what they mean together, you have three exceptions, three cases. And then Alice versus CLS comes up with that theory, uh, because the Federal Circuit still didn't know what to do with Bilski. And there are open questions uh, regarding Bilski. And even with Myriad, I mean, there's a case I'll talk about in a few minutes uh, that's percolating from the Northern District of California, which has to do with fetal DNA, uh, Ariosa versus Sequinam, uh, which is probably be in the federal circuit in the next few years. And then I think people are saying that may be the follow up to, to Myriad uh, in terms of what exactly, you know, how, how exactly should that be interpreted. Uh, so, this is kind of an interesting kind of structure in which these cases. Uh, uh, come up and so forth. Uh, and so um, a myriad is then the, the third of these four cases, and I've talked about this uh, in some detail, uh, putting some context in it. Uh, but the, the, the notion that seems to be uh, with the myriad case is it deals with natural phenomenon. You've got the Alice, Mayo, Bilski line of cases that seem to be dealing with abstract ideas and laws of nature, and it's not quite clear how they all necessarily fit together. Uh, if you look at sort of general principles that, that seem to be coming out uh, of those cases, uh, there seems to be a notion that 
uh, there has to be something that's an inventive concept uh, that the courts and the agencies, the patent office, needs to be careful that somebody is not just simply trying to patent uh, sort of a broad law or a broad principle. You know, they're not trying to patent a hedging or patent uh, the type of uh, uh, financing that was occurring in the Alice Bank case, uh, the securitized financing that is occurring there. So this sort of broad principle, uh, kind of a broad concept. And so in that way, it sounds a bit like the idea expression distinction in, in copyright uh, for those. I mean, so the idea is that uh, uh, the notion there is that you know copyright allows this, this realm of ideas that anybody can tap into. It's just that when you have a concrete expression, uh, that uh, you have copyright getting attached, and we can, you know, argue for that either, you know, from a Lockean theory of capture, maybe, or you know, some cultural theory that you know, once things are written down, they have some sort of primacy, and therefore that's going to be the basis for primacy. We can explore that debate a little bit, but that seems to be the analogy uh, in patent law that you know, if, if, if things are sort of broadly uh, patented, then that's a bad thing. We should try to avoid that. Uh, but we need to identify some sort of an inventive concept. The problem, of course, is you know the idea expression. Again, talking about dichotomies, maybe that works in copyright law. Uh, we could question about that work, but it seems to be fairly workable. You know, as as law goes, it's workable. Um, but in patent law, it's very strange because ideas are patentable, and the whole idea of a concept, even the term inventive concept, is suggesting that there's some realm of ideas which would be subject to capture or ownership. And, and so now we're talking about abstract ideas that are not patentable and somehow less than abstract ideas or somewhat more concrete ideas. Maybe it's the distinction between fully baked and half baked or, or something that the court is trying to articulate. But nonetheless, that is you know, some notion that there has to be some inventive. And I'll talk a bit about that when we look at reasons for, uh, for concern and confusion over Myriad in a few minutes. Uh, but there is this notion of inventive concept. There's also this notion of preemption, right? So these are kind of broad principles that come out of these cases, and the court is sort of saying, agency, lower courts, follow this. And presumably, the, the, that directive goes down to the practitioners when they're drafting the patent application, either to try to conform with the law or to find ways of getting around it, as practitioners are wont to do. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the preemption idea maybe has a little bit more viability uh, because the, it, it, we can sort of come up with you know, common sense examples of this that work readily. Um, somebody tries to patent a basic mathematical principle or a scientific principle. Uh, whatever that might be is sort of an interesting question because you may not know until 100 years what exactly is the right scientific principle. But putting that aside, if there's a notion, and this is what's interesting about the the Supreme Court cases in the 70s where they're trying to deal with this notion of preemption in software and computer science, which was a burgeoning field. It may be an also an issue in geoengineering as to when are you preempting something, uh, especially in a field that's just emerging, and everything builds on something else. But when you have a few building blocks, it may be really hard to say when you aren't preempting, right? If you have uh, building blocks that are very clear or foundational, sort of a, a canon is what the court is sort of seems to be saying, then it becomes clear to figure out when there's going to be preemption and when there's not. But at least the notion of preemption is workable in the sense that you can make a reference to some community. And so, for example, in the software cases, uh, the, one of the early cases, Gottschalk versus Benson, had to do with converting from a binary coded decimal to binary. I believe that was the conversion. And that was the, the subject of the, the patent. And the court says, well, this is the kind of thing it seems like you would need for computer science to build. I mean, it's still, it's still a nascent field, relatively young field, but this seems sort of foundational. And therefore, we're very wary. It's almost like a precautionary principle. We don't want to extend patent to this under the concerns that would go that way. And it would be interesting to see where Myriad, how Myriad would have come out if the case had gone to the Supreme Court uh, you know, not in 2014, uh, but in 1990s, right? Just as kind of the beginning of the Human Genome Project and so forth. Whether the court would have come out the same way, would the court have said maybe like in Diamond versus Chakraborty, 
Of course, this is going to be very open for patenting. This is just a rich area. We're not going to go, or they're going to say the human genome is so fundamental that we don't want ownership. I mean, part of it obviously has to do with the personality of the justices, but I'm sort of trying to fl flush this out in this notion of what exactly is the preemption principle. So my point here in terms of trying to give uh, some context uh, to Myriad is, uh, first of all, putting it in line with these other cases than to show that there is some sort of a disconnect between the treatment of natural phenomenon and the treatment of, treatment of the other two exclusions. Uh, but also, there seem to be some big principles that the court wants to go to as, it's, as a generalist court to provide some sort of guidance. Right? So uh, that's kind of the, the background to this. Um, where do we go post myriad? I mean, it's a little bit presumptuous since it's been only a year, but there have been about uh, 16 or so cases that have relied on myriad and tried to interpret it. Uh, many of them are in the patent area. One that I'll talk about in a few minutes is in the area of prisoners' rights in, in criminal law, but uh, uh, I'll show you how that comes up and works in a few minutes. Uh, but the big cases, uh, um, I, can, I can give a list of the cases, and as I write this, I'll, uh, I'll flesh this out. But the two big cases uh, that I'll talk about, and then if I have time, can mention some others, and I'm glad to take questions, are the Ariosa versus Sacronam case uh, that uh, was decided by the Northern District of California, and then the Roslyn case, the Roslyn Institute case, that was decided by the Federal Circuit uh, in, uh, in, uh, in just in May of this year. And so now the Rosalind Institute case is uh, really the first Federal Circuit case that goes into Myriad in some sort of depth. So this is fairly important for that reason. Uh, but the, the, the reason of the case, a very short opinion, seems very mechanical. It's sort of basically saying that the clone sheet is identical, almost by, by tautology, almost by definition, with the, the natural, naturally occurring sheet Therefore, under, uh, under Myriad, this is not patentable subject matter. Okay, so this is sort of the identity or equivalent case uh, that seemed to be the reasoning in Myriad itself. Uh, the isolated DNA sequences, if you look at sort of the information content, is the same as the DNA that exists uh, in nature, and therefore that's going to be the basis for uh, saying not patentable subject matter. Okay. Not much analysis there. There's really no discussion from what I could tell in Rosalind about the concepts of inventive concept or preemption. It seems to be, and in some ways this is, you know, it, you know, if you're worried about the Federal Circuit not listening to the Supreme Court, it's hard to fault them in Rosalind because they seem to just say, okay, well, the Supreme Court said there's this tautology. We find it here. Therefore, we follow it in finding that the clone sheep is not patentable subject matter. Uh, this is one case where you hope the Federal Circuit may have done something different to provide some, some light on this issue. But, you know, it's, it wasn't in some ways a surprising opinion, uh, given the kind of uh, analysis in Myriad. The Ariosa versus Sequinon case is, uh, I think, going to be a more controversial case. Uh, this is going to probably be in the Federal Circuit, as I understand, uh, uh, you know, next year or so. It's going through the appellate process, uh, going through some other reviews at the district court level. Um, uh, but the Northern District of California issued this opinion in, in the end of October last year, and it has to do with a, with a patent for diagnosing uh, the, the proclivity towards Down syndrome uh, by identifying certain types of uh, uh, markers, male DNA, uh, in, in, in fetuses. So it's the fetal DNA. Uh, and the, the nature of this patent is one where the, the methodology, as I understand it, uh, involved looking at, you know, fairly invasively at amniotic fluid to identify the fetal DNA. Uh, the, the, the patent donor, Sequinom in this case, had developed a method that involved looking at blood, mother's blood uh, and serum, uh, to identify this, uh, this, this sequence. And the court, again, the reasoning of the court um, is not, you know, if you're trying to really kind of isolate, you know, how they came up with the result, that this was not patentable subject matter. It really boiled down to them saying that, okay, you have a naturally occurring DNA sequence. That's what the patent covers. It's about identifying this. And I emphasize the word identifying for reasons uh, they'll, they'll make clear in a few minutes. But they're just identifying it. But they're just simply identifying it uh, using uh, mother's blood rather than amniotic fluid. And therefore, there doesn't seem to be any sort of inventive concept uh, that they've really identified here uh, that is worthy of patents. So, Can yeah, like, wouldn't that be a, wouldn't that be a method process though, method patent? 
Because they could say, well, you know, the method through right. which we're identifying this right. is, is, is different. Yeah, you know, right. because, okay, so, what we're identifying right. mightn't be different, but how we're yeah. identifying it is different. Yeah, good. So this is where, you know, you think about the three categories, abstract idea, yeah. law of nature, and natural yeah. phenomenon. Natural phenomenon, we think about applying to composition of matter. This is sort of that, those three distinctions. Yeah. So the thing that's interesting, I think this will definitely be argued in front of the federal circuit, is should that approach be the same as for, for methods? Mm -hmm. And of course, the sequinom case was decided before Alice versus CLS Bank, which seems to suggest a two-step approach for method patents and system patents, right? And so Bilski, again, is a method patent to say that the method you're trying to patent is just too abstract and that there is no inventive concept. The, the sequinom case has to do with uh, this kind of mixture of this natural phenomenon, the composition of matter, but within the diagnostic method. So certainly, you know, post Alice Bank, there would be a different methodology that the court would apply, and that would suggest that, you know, there might be a reversal on that ground. In other words, the argument that Sequinam is making is there is something inventive here. There is an inventive concept here. The court seems to focus too much on the fact that you're just identifying the natural phenomenon mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. the naturally occurring DNA. Okay, any? Yeah. yeah. So uh, there are other cases I could talk about if I had some time. Uh, I, might, I might go to questions and so forth. But those are the main cases, I think, in terms of giving you the context for, for Myriad. Uh, and there are obviously other things that I, that I could discuss. And I think uh, uh, I'd probably leave it at that at that, this point in terms of uh, you know, where the case is. And uh, obviously, there's a lot of. Uh, discussion about responses to Myriad, uh, especially in light of Alice versus uh, CLS Bank. But I think the main point is, you know, this natural phenomenon exception. What exactly does that mean? And I'm going to I'm going to argue that those that's sort of the source for some of the confusion and unhappiness whether the, by this case. I mean, I think uh, folks who like patents, I guess I hate to put it that way, but that's probably the, the best way to think about this because I think they are people who just you know, just simply uncritically love patents. Uh, and I have colleagues, I won't mention them, I to sort of have that. And we have this back and forth and so forth with, with colleagues at Wisconsin. Uh, they thought, oh no, the whole, the, you know, the world is going to fall apart. Um, I probably have a more moderate view. My view is, well, you know, the court left off one thing, isolated DNA, and that would have been a very different decision if they had done that 20 years ago. But now, you know, that's, I'm not saying we've, I, we've identified all of those things. But the synthetic DNA is still left open. And of course, Myriad seemed to love this decision. Uh, for whatever it's worth, I mean, there were some reports about stock prices going up afterwards. But if you look at various Myriad's various patents on the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes and the diagnostic techniques that they have, there are about how many? I think there are about you know, 20 or so claims. I forget the exact number. This only invalidated less than half of them, right? And so they still have all of these patent claims that are still valid that they are now litigating. So one of the aftermaths of the Myriad cases are, you know, more cases by Myriad uh, uh, trying to uh, enforce their patents. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, how they, those play out. But they, those are largely playing out uh, in the uh, in the district court in Utah, uh, where Myriad is uh, is located. And so, you know, Myriad likes these cases. Uh, surprisingly, uh, people, however, who wanted to see something a little bit more policy oriented. Um, we're really, I, I was kind of completely baffled when I first read this. I think most people were, I mean, Kara will have her thoughts. Uh, were you completely baffled? I mean, not to, not to preempt your talk. <laughs> yeah. Baffled, no. Okay. It's all right. It's not, we'll it's not any that. more baffled, let me put it that way. Than anything else? <laughs> than we already were with that. Well, well, the thing that baffled me is that there was no law <laughs> in this opinion, other than, and I'll talk about that, I guess, in the second half of my talk now. It just seemed to be, um, I don't know what the right word would be, a very naturalistic, positivistic, well, here's the science, and you know, this rule naturally follows from the science. At least that's how I read it the first time. Well, and that made it, it wasn't much law on Bilski either. It's an abstract idea because it's an abstract idea. Yeah, yeah fair enough, fair enough. So at least, in, and, and I, I would say that's probably true for Bilski. There was some engagement, at least, with the industry in Bilski. And I guess, I guess Mayo was more fresh in my mind when I read Myriad than Bilski. And the thing about Mayo, Mayo had to do with a medical diagnostic test uh, and a therapeutic test for the treatment of Crohn's disease. And so the underlying uh, patent, uh, uh, I mentioned Mayo a little bit yesterday, had to do with uh, 
taking some sort of biometrics from a patient and then applying a drug, seeing how the patient responded, and then adjusting the drug. And the court said that that was not patentable subject matter because it was a law of nature and that there was no inventive concept that was being added. And again, um, I can take that apart and I'll maybe talk about that a little bit. But the thing that struck me about Mayo is that there was a conscious recognition by Justice Breyer in that case is that you know, there is a problem with, this, with a patent like this because of how it affects medical practice. And if you look at all the discussion about Myriad, that was sort of the big issue that comes up in Myriad is you know, you've got to pay for a second, a second opinion. I mean, you have to pay already how much money, $1,000 for one test, you've got to pay again for a second test, which you know, may be more of an insurance finance problem in the US in terms of how we manage our health care. But nonetheless, that was sort of a lot of the policy rhetoric. And I was surprised that there was none of that. I mean, even there was, and that may not be that surprising from this court, but it was surprising in light of what I remembered a year earlier in May. That, that's sort of, sort of my reaction. Yeah. They don't even mention the word health. I mean, it's, it's very <laughs> peculiar. I mean, given all the litigation over yeah, yeah. a myriad in multiple different jurisdictions, it's, uh, and all, all the right. briefs that they received. Right, I, mean, right. I found it quite extraordinary, particularly given the way in which the American Civil Liberties Union were. But Thomas wrote it, right? It's not surprising given he wrote it. Yeah, but again, I guess this is all, we don't know why, I mean, uh, I don't have much insight on how they decide this stuff, but yeah, but, but that's, uh, I, guess, I guess my view to that response is somebody assigned it to Thomas to write knowing that this is what they're going to all sign on to, right? So I don't know enough about the intro, I don't know if anybody does, but uh, uh, that's, you know, when the tomb gets unsealed 100 years from now, we'll <laughs> know. But it suggests that there are other types of practice that were important other than healthcare practice. In Myriad? Yeah. So which, what are you thinking well, about? Well, another view is that it's about establishing enough freedom to do research, right? Um, yeah. You could uh, maybe be suspicious that the US government had their fingers burnt a little bit with the Human Genome Project of Watson and his family's patenting activity around mm -hmm. that. And they saw some similar kind of constriction of research practice occurring in the state right. to free that up. And I would just take Matt's point again, is the word research is a <laughs> In the opinion, either it is a very, a very odd opinion, and I, it, Thomas is interesting, right? I mean, Thomas is a the, the hyper originalist. Uh, you know, there's a case a couple of years ago. I may have the right case about the uh, violent video games, and whether the state could put restrictions on violent video games. And I think that was noted because Thomas had an opinion where he kept talking about I think 18th or 19th century child rearing practices. It's like. Does it have to do with violent video game? But the again, originalists go back to kind of history. I, mean, I guess to be fair, Scalia was studying the Grimm's fairy tales. So there's a lot of violence in there. But but there's kind of this originalist notion. There seems to be. I think it was Bronwyn. I maybe mean, mentioned talking about origin stories. Mm -hmm. But there seemed to be some sort of origin story that you know that that Justice Thomas wanted to talk about, where the origin is somewhere after the Big Bang and maybe slightly after Watson and Crick. I don't know where this origin would be. Uh, but that seemed to be, the, I mean, that's why I take you mean by Justice Thomas writing the opinion, right? in part. Well, and yeah, and writing it very short, <coughs> and very narrow. Yeah, yeah. But not <coughs> talking about policy. I, I mean, it's very peculiar, too, because it's really just Sprayer who is pushing. Um, you know, there was an early version of the Prometheus battle in which the court threw out the case on the basis that was improvidently <coughs> granted the writ of certiara. But <coughs> Ray was, was busy yeah. kind of right. saying I we really need to consider case, yeah. patentability, but somehow he seems to have shifted the other court. But he's not necessarily the spokesman for the. Yeah, you're talking about in the myriad decision. In the myriad yeah, case, yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, in our yeah. argument, he was yeah. very active. But in the the decision itself, his language is not really represented by Thomas. Yeah, and I don't know, I and mean, this is where, as I say, we don't know until the tomb is unsealed, uh, because this is all the internal workings uh, of the uh, of the court, how they decide this. Uh, uh, Breyer did write Octavius, and I'll talk about Octavius, as I said, that'll be, that's why you know when, it, when I'm stopped, when I'm done, uh, a few weeks later. And so there may have been some horse trading, because a lot of this has to do with like the minutia of, you know, well, I got 20 opinions to write, and Breyer only has one. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sure that plays into this a little bit. Doesn't the Chief Justice always assign piece of the majority? Yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And of course, yeah, and Octavius, you're right, just Chief Justice was in the dissent there. And so I guess that it goes to this next scene. I forget how it goes, yeah. The most senior person in the majority. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, but, but I think Octavius, though, 
Breyer was going to do it. I mean, it's sort of very clear because he's, you know, when, when you have sort of this competition law IP type cases, so Breyer also wrote the Kirsten decision regarding the exhaustion uh, for first sale of case books. And so again, that had the same kind of flavor. But I, mean, I, I guess I just have to feign ignorance in terms of how the internal decisions are made. Uh, I mean, I remember when we had, uh, uh, we had the IP <coughs> list serve, and there was the one decision that came out a few weeks ago. What, what, it wasn't now, I thought it was another, anyway, whatever the decision was. Area. Yeah. Pardon me? Area. Maybe it was area, or maybe it was pre-area. Because I think the question was, we know that this justice wrote this opinion. What does that tell us about the next opinion? And that's the kind of pontification that we're left to do, because, you know, we can't see inside the tooth until it's uh, sealed. Uh, but that's, that's, that's sort of the, the, the dynamic here. But I wouldn't be surprised, I mean, I was surprised when Justice Thomas did write that opinion, though, uh, you know, Justice Thomas, um, uh, you know, worked for Monsanto. You know, people know, you know he was an in-house counselor for Monsanto, right? Was he, in-house, uh, he worked for Monsanto after law school. Uh, that was one of his first jobs. I guess maybe, but he, <laughs> I haven't. The <laughs> call will come. When I was walking over here, there were some other uh, conference attendees, and one of them said, uh, uh, some one of them asked the other, what, what are you going to talk about? He said, I don't know, but you know the expression, uh, everything's been said, but not everybody has said it. <laughs> so hopefully my talk's not like that. But in any case, uh, uh, but um, he worked for Monsanto. There's a case called JEM. Um, for, uh, it was a post uh, uh, Chakraborty case in 2000, having to do with uh, whether you could have both plant patent protection and uh, utility patent protection. Uh, and so that's a that's a, another uh, case where you see kind of this imprimatur uh, of Thomas, you know, coming out. Uh, so in that sense, maybe it wasn't that surprising because maybe he's the go-to guy from biotechnology. Um, who knows? All right. Uh, so let me talk about some of the reasons for confusion because some of these are very interesting, and I'd like to take these apart. And I guess we'll talk later this afternoon about paper projects and other things. But I think the idea behind the paper project. Is, you know, obviously I have more of a descriptive thing that I've done so far, uh, but now we get into the analysis. And one of the analysis is just the role of science uh, in this case, right? Because uh, we have this famous Justice Scalia concurrence, maybe one of the shortest things he's ever written, uh, and so forth, where, uh, you know, it's a 9-0 it's opinion. Uh, Justice Thomas, as you mentioned, wrote the majority, and Justice Scalia says, um, I join the judgment of the court and all of its opinion except part 1A, and some parts of the rest of the opinion going into fine details of molecular biology. So part 1A is the biotechnology for dummy, biotechnology for me type of opinion. Um, and then he goes on to say, I'm unable to affirm those details. I love this portion, and for a reason I'll talk about in a minute. I'm unable to affirm those details on my knowledge or even my own belief. It suffices for me to affirm, having studied the opinions below and the expert briefs presented here, that the portion of DNA isolated from its natural state sought to be patented is identical to that portion of the DNA in its natural state, and that complementary DNA is a synthetic creation not normally present in nature. So he's not looking at the science. I guess he's sort of, I guess, being very honest about this. And this is why, again, looking at the Justice Thomas opinion, I'm not saying that's just, when eight justices signed on to that, could they all be dishonest? Sure, why not? But. Uh, you know, there's a lot of maybe false consciousness, lots of things that are interesting going on here, but there seemed to be a view in the, in the, in the, in the majority opinion that the, kind of the, the legal ruling falls inevitably from their understanding of the science. And at least Justice, Justice Scalia say, I don't really know the science. All I know is that there's a legal rule wherever it came from. I'm not going to go into the policy, but there's a legal rule. The legal rule is if you've got something that's identical to what's in nature, you can't patent that thing. All right, end of story. And I take for granted that the cDNA is different and the isolated one is the same, therefore not patentable. And that's how I read Scalia's opinion. Just a rule, we're not gonna talk about the policies, we're just simply gonna apply it, sorry, yeah. You don't put any weight on belief. Well, I was gonna talk about that because that comes up a little bit later in the one opinion which cites Mary, the prisoner's relief, the prisoner relief case. Uh, the belief when I got really interested again, I was curious about this because of there was a lot of speculation about Scalia as the you know fairly fairly devout Catholic on the court. I mean Thomas is as well though, um, um, so I think this is maybe Scalia's legal process positivism maybe intersecting 
the word the use of the word belief is just very uh, disturbing and interesting. Exactly what he means by that. He could. He could. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. I mean, when I read that, I always I thought about how you answered a complaint. Oh upon yeah. The information in, was in the yeah, U.S. law. Yeah, interesting. Upon information yeah. and belief, I hereby say blah blah blah. And I read it in that way, which has nothing to do with religious. Religious belief. Beliefs. Yeah. 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 But obviously, if you stare at it for a while, you might start thinking religious beliefs. I thought he was being a little bit, you know, sort of sarcastic and legalistic in his silly way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, that's upon information and belief. Blah blah blah. And that's he's sort of taking the pleadings as given on what the scientific facts are mm -hmm. and then making the inference based upon that. Yeah, I, I guess when I thought about this again, I was thinking about the Hobby Lobby case, whatever, a few weeks ago, you know, which had to do with um, um, sort of an opt-out from uh, the, the requirements of paying for certain types of contraception. And you know, that, that case, um, I don't want to go off too much on that case, but, but it is relevant to what I'm going to read from the Justice Judge Posner opinion in a few minutes. You know, that case, you know, one of the things that bothered me, I, the, the idea of the exclusion for for-profits is problematic. I can understand sort of, you know, you have citizens that have certain convictions and they're voicing them through a corporation. How should you teach, deal with that under the statute? And that, it's important to recognize that's a statutory case where the Congress ex you know, gives exemptions for religious beliefs. I mean, they can be, uh, you know, from, from uh, participating in the military. It doesn't apply to taxes. It can apply to uh, the one case that's going up now, post Hobby Lobby involves a prisoner who wants to wear a beard uh, for religious reasons. He's a devout Muslim, and the corrections of physical, though he can't have a beard, because I think the rationale they gave is if you escape, how will we recognize you? You'll just shave off your beard or something like that. Whatever, uh, but in any case, that's kind of the, the, the types of cases, uh, and I could sort of see that. I guess the question is, what does it mean to have a, a religious belief in that case? I mean, just is it a religious belief for you to say that uh, an IUD is a type of abortion? I mean, I, I can understand why you might have a religious belief against abortion, but then how do you then extrapolate that from all of these other really kind of scientific, I would describe factual type of um, you know, concerns, right? So. Yeah, that, 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 that troubled me. I mean, what exactly? And then I, when I was researching this, there's this case from the Seventh Circuit, and this is Judge Posner, a law and economics judge, uh, pragmatist. I mean, he's, he's, I would describe him as secular. Um, but this is a case involving prisoner relief. It has nothing to do with patent law. Uh, and it's a case where the prisoner's arguing that the corrections facilities denied him medication, and so his hypertension increased. And the magistrate judge, uh, the lower court judge, says, yes, uh, you were harmed by the correction facility. We can see that uh, you had some uh, adverse effect to health. But Judge Posner reverses. And this is kind of interesting to see why he reverses. He says, uh, what is troubling about the case is not its disposition, that, but that both the district judge and the magistrate judge, whose recommendations to grant summary judgment the district judge accepted, believe that Jackson can present evidence. Again, I think belief here is in the way Kara suggested, uh, you know, in terms of how you look at the pleadings, that he had experienced a serious medical condition as a consequence of the interruption of his medication. This is mistaken, and not surprisingly, has no support in the record, but is not only report, repeated in the plaintiff's brief in this court, as one would expect, it is largely ignored by the defendant. So the, but the Judge Posner's questioning is, is there a basis to say that your adverse health effects were due to the fact that you're deprived certain medications by the corrections facility? And now we get into the, the, the connection to uh, Myriad. This lapse, in other words, the court just really relying upon the, uh, or making a judgment that's not really in the record. This lapse is worth noting because it is indicative of a widespread and increasingly troublesome discomfort among lawyers and judges confronted by a scientific or other technological issue. And then they cite our colleague Peter Lee at UC Davis. As a general matter, lawyers and science don't mix. It's the citation to Peter Lee's work. And then see also Association for Molecular Pathology <laughs> versus Myriad Genetics. And then in parentheses, Justice Scalia concurring in part and concurring in the judgment I joined the defend. I joined the judgment of the court. Just basically what I read you quoted here. Let me just read you some more of these about what the court says. Because I find this 
fairly interesting. I'll just skim over some of the extensive science, science quotes. Uh, the court then does a string side to use of scientific evidence in courts and so forth. And then the uh, Justice Posner, Judge Posner continues, the discomfort of the legal profession, including the judiciary with science and technology, is not a new phenomenon. Innumerable are the lawyers who explain that they picked law over a technical field because they have a quote unquote math block. <laughs> and then there's a quote, law students as a group seem peculiarly averse to math and science. <laughs> so I'm citing our colleague De uh, David Feigman at Arizona State. Uh, <laughs> of course you know what scientists say. Uh, that they got into biology because they couldn't do maths. That's uh, a famous quote of um, a biologist. Uh, what do you do when you get to an equation in a paper? And that's what I hold to generally. Right, right, right. <laughs> and so you know, the, the court basically is saying here that there's just enough, not enough science. Uh, so there had to be more scientific basis. So this fits into a line of cases having to do with uh, scientific testimony and expert testimony. But I was just surprised by, I mean, Judge Posner and, and I think Justice Scalia have a very odd relationship. I mean, some of this is public. I don't know if people, if we could follow it on the, some of the blogs where uh, Judge Posner has taken Justice Scalia to task on his legal reasoning and his originalism and so forth. That's and, the you know, review from Posner of Scalia's book. Right, Scalia and Brock Garner's book, just yeah. Excoriated. Right, 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 right. I think he even calls him dishonest, I think, yeah. or, or the other way around, something like that. But, but in any case, I thought this was kind of a, an odd, I, I don't think this is indicative of where Myriad is going, but I thought this is just an interesting example of you know, how the court deals with, with science and how it approaches this notion of natural phenomena. Right, and so I think this is implicit even in the law of nature, of what exactly the court considers a law of nature. I, that's something that bothered me in the Mayo versus Prometheus decision, because the court never really identifies what the law of nature is that's being preempted. Um, they seem to be saying that there's some correlation uh, between the drug that was applied and the biometric levels, whatever the, whatever the measurements for the patient would be, as sort of the underlying law or regularity. But it wasn't quite completely clear to me in that case whether that was a pure law of nature case or something else. But my general view, when I look at the disappointment to the confusion of Myriad, is I think, you know, maybe looking at the briefs, maybe looking at sort of the background, I mean, this is kind of interesting to sort of piece together uh, for something that I'll talk about in a minute as to why the court did what it did. But the court sort of reduced it to a question of science. And there's some notion that going from whatever the, the scientific answer is, that would have some implication for what the law is. So if I kind of understand the implicit syllogism, the, 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 the rule would be something like, you know, natural phenomenon are non-patentable per se. Uh, natural phenomenon will be determined by some scientific inquiry. Here the scientific inquiry leads us to say that isolated DNA uh, sequences are natural phenomenon, therefore. Uh, but you know, things don't, you know, this is the, there's a reason why we have the scientific method. It's just syllogism so to take us. And that's why you have legal method and other forms of reasoning. But the court seems to want to kind of fold it into that in terms of this. And I found that to be, and I, I would argue, one of the reasons why the case is fairly disappointing, because it, it seems to want to do this in a way that ignore some of the policy concerns. And maybe it had to do with Justice Thomas writing the opinion, or it may be having to do with the court, which is not completely comfortable with this particular domain, uh, and so going that way. You know, none of these choices are inevitable, of course. I mean, we could have had, I mean, I think Matt was envisioning, or maybe I'm envisioning a world where Justice Breyer, you know, you know in the mantle of Mayo and Kirsten, which are by no means perfect opinions, but they did engage in the policies. Uh, you know, we have the Aereo decision, which again, uh, which had to do with broadcasting uh, television through the internet, where again the court, uh, Breyer ruling against the company, finding copyright infringement, while Justice Scalia saying, no, this is not copyright infringement. But again, these are cases where, um, and I, I probably should have thought a little bit more about the area, but if, you know, I can incorporate this in the final paper, but the court is trying to understand the technology. And if you look at Justice Breyer's opinion, Justice Breyer's opinion basically saying is the internet broadcast is just like a cable system. We have a regulatory system for cable, therefore QED, they need to follow those rules. Well, Justice Scalia seems to be looking at sort of a pre-cable world, or at least pre-cable regulation world. 
because uh, his opinion reminded me quite a bit of the fortnightly and teleprompter cases as to what exactly you had a public performance. But so even there you have this kind of engagement with technology and, and uh, rather than really necessarily thinking about the policy. So, I mean, arguably, if you try to defend Breyer's opinion, he was thinking about the policies. He, you know, once he thought about it as cable, he recognized this kind of policy regime for cable and was concerned about opt-outs from that regime. Right? And, and the same thing for Scalia. So, uh, but it may be the case that they can handle, uh, you know, there's all sorts of questions about the justices and, and technology. I, I'm always hesitant about when I read these articles, both scholarly about, oh, judges don't understand technology, because that kind of assumes that the technology is gonna give you the answer, understanding the technology, rather than you know, understanding the policies of what you need to engage with. So, you know, does it matter that Justice Roberts was, conf was confused by the fact that sometimes two, a person might have two cell phones? I mean, that was the issue in the case involving cell phone searches that got a lot of press. And he asked, oh, people have two cell phones? Why would they have that? Ever? Uh, does that matter? No, he actually wrote a very good opinion that engaged in the policies uh, in that case. And so, I'm not saying that you should be ignorant about the technology. I guess there's certain cases where we can point to where the court just didn't simply understand the technology and went, went off, or didn't really understand the policies and went off, or the combination. Maybe mirroring is a situation where the court veered too much in the direction of saying, hey, we're nerds too, we understand this, uh, uh, without necessarily engaging in the policies for whatever reason. Now, one hypothesis for why the court did this is that the court was just simply following the Solicitor General or the governments. Because if you look at the distinction between um, um, naturally occurring DNA and synthetic DNA, that goes back, I think that's in my stack of papers over there, to the Solicitor General's brief. So this gets to the second point uh, about the reasons for confusion, is that you know patent practitioners, patent activists wanted sort of more of a policy, kind of a real kind of flag they could wave. I mean, both sides wanted that and didn't really get it. Uh, and one of the reasons, I think, is that the court was very conscious of its role as an institutional actor, and specifically really saying, and, and this may be acquiescence. I mean, this is, again, we could have a debate about whether they're acquiescing their role or kind of being more deferential, as courts should be. Uh, this is, again, uh, there was an interesting editorial I saw about uh, the Hobby Lobby case about uh, Alexander Bickel, how the courts should really be the less, the less dangerous branch and have more of a passive uh, kind of deferential role. And, um, and so maybe that's sort of what was happening here. We could argue again acquiescence, uh, but they're just simply following the Solicitor General saying that should be the distinction. You know, a lot of these cases the court takes, and this comes up a little bit in the Metabolite case, uh, where the court you know, does this, you know, in the metabolite case that Matthew is referring to, the court grants cert on a patentable subject matter case in 2005, and everybody was very excited. What's this case going to be? And the final decision was we should never have taken cert on this case. Sorry. And then Justice Breyer having an extensive dissent saying, well, no, yes, we should. Sort of foreshadowing some of the things we're seeing now a little bit. Uh, but that case also, there was some uh, feedback from the government as to whether they should have even granted the case at that point. So, sorry, well, what, what do you think about the Federal Circuit, which was so critical of the US government's brief? I mean, I think they kind of complained about their magic microscope theory and ridiculed their kind of yeah. approach and kind of splintered into three distinctive approaches. And then suddenly the US government finds favor with the Supreme Court. Well, what do you think is going on there with the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court and their radically different approaches? Yeah, well, yeah, well part of the Federal Circuit, I mean, the three judges in the Federal Circuit decision, the Lowry, Moore, and Bryce, they have you know, very interesting perspectives, right, on this uh, subject matter quite distinction. I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in, in my point about invention versus discovery. But I think in terms of the, 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 the dynamic there, the question really is, where is the, where is the federal circuit, and maybe more precisely, specific judges within the federal circuit view their institutional role? And I get the impression, Kyra, Kyra probably disagree with me, or have a, a, a different perspective, that they a lot of them do view themselves as not not rogue or renegade. That's kind of a you know, Sarah Palin kind of has co that word, but uh, they kind of view themselves as this sort of independent, autonomous court, 
I mean, I did a separate case. I mentioned this a little bit yesterday. I'm writing a, an article on uh, the Federal Circuit and contract cases, especially having to do with patent assignments. And in those areas, instead of looking at sort of state law of contracts, they sort of create their own law of contracts. So there is that notion that, OK, we are beholden to patent law. But I'm obviously being extreme here in this. I, I, maybe you could make the point that they're beholden to the patent bar. This gets into a little bit of the controversies over Judge Rader, uh, who stepped down a few weeks ago, but uh, months ago now, I guess. Um, I think that may be a little, I mean, whatever that mean, might, might mean. Certainly they're more sympathetic to the patent bar than the court is. I mean, whenever the court refers, the Supreme Court refers to the patent bar, as I read it, they seem to be saying, well, we don't want to create a rule that the patent bar, they don't use the phrase patent bar, but they're explicitly saying, we don't want something that a careful draftsman can work around. Which is read to me like, oh, the patent bar is going to try to evade this rule. And so they want to try to avoid that. Uh, I, I certainly think the Federal Circuit is more um, you know, concerned about those issues rather than that kind of, and that, that may be accurate, because that is their, the way they're created. I mean, just getting into kind of uh, the normative aspect, uh, you know, what the court should do. Should they be beholden to this, or should they take a more, uh, you know, kind of a different normative tact, even if they're designated as the court that deals with patent issues? So that, that would be my response to, to that. As far as the three just the judges, I mean, if you remember the, the, the Federal Circuit opinion, it was very interesting um, because you had Judge Lowry uh, making the point that uh, the, the isolated DNA sequence is different from the naturally occurring one. So the, the very act of isolating or snipping it is changing the chemical composition of the DNA sequence, so it's different. And of course, Lowry's background, I think his PhD is in chemistry or chemical engineering, I think it's in chemistry. So he's approaching this, this is sort of a great parallel to the discussion I think we had yesterday, a number of speakers, about what model are you using? Yeah, like right. Yeah, right, yeah, is it a biology model? Or even you can make the argument in mirror, there's almost like a software model, right? They were talking about kind of the code uh, in some sense, but, but that's, another, that's another tangent maybe. Uh, so there's that aspect that Lowry takes a look at. About, and then uh, Bryson taking the view that there's nothing inventive, and therefore this is not patentable subject matter, and Moore taking a more pragmatic view in some sense, uh, uh, talking in part about reliance issues and uh, kind of the institutional effects of having a rule that would. Though, you know, my response to, to Judge Justin, and this it may fit into your talk a little bit with, uh, about the implication of Myriad, is that maybe Myriad is reflecting a shifting industry. I mean, Isolated DNA sequences are important, but really maybe the real money is in synthetic DNA. I mean, this is, you know, we talk about tailoring patent law for very precise incentives. Maybe that's what the court unconsciously was doing, or maybe the Solicitor General was doing that, saying, look, the technology, we think the technology, we as the government think that the technology or the industry is shifting, therefore the patent incentives have to shift. So that's, what, that's why I think it's a very interesting question how Mary would have come out if it had come before the court. I mean, holding everything else constant, the personality of judges and, and so forth, you know, 20 years ago, you know, right as the, you know, 24 years ago, right as the Human Genome Project was sort of kicking off, uh, whether it would have a very different result in that case and, and the government kind of dictating things. So, uh, you know, the heart of the problem, I think, in this na the na nature or natural phenomenon that comes up, and so this would be the third, um, <coughs> the third kind of confusion, is this notion of invention versus discovery. And so this is why I kind of emphasize, um, you know, some of the language in, um, in, uh, in the Ariosa versus Sequinon case, like identify. And if you look at a lot of the verbs, I haven't gone through, I should go, I should have, I did this at one point, just sort of underline the different verbs. A lot of the verbs that the Supreme Court uses in the Myriad case are ones that suggest a more of a uh, spelunking expedition, <laughs> right? I mean, they were not so much the researcher finding the DNA sequence uh, is analogous to James Cook finding, you know, terra incognita, right? I mean, it's kind of the language of discovery that the court uh, thinks is not invented. That's something else. And if you look at some of the cases on natural phenomenon, one of the big exclusions for natural phenomenon, and this is where if you look at how that, the common law development of that, were early cases having to do with minerals, that minerals couldn't be patented. And some of the early natural phenomenon cases had to do, for example, 
uh, I think the name of the case is American Wood Paper from 1874, uh, <clears throat> having to do with wood pulp and a process of extracting wood pulp for the use of paper, not patentable subject matter. And, and so a lot of these cases, the court seems to be making a demarcation, I think, between um, intellectual property or patent law, whatever the right moniker is, and real property and maybe even personal property. So the natural phenomenon of, of uh, exclusion is, again, policing that boundary. And as I mentioned earlier, that boundary may in part have to do with copyrightable subject matter, trademark subject matter, but it may also have to do with you know, federal patent law versus the things that in the US would be relegated to provincial or state law, such as rights in minerals, uh, you know, rights in these other types of natural resources. And so that may be uh, you know, sort of the background to this. Uh, there may be policy reasons for having that discussion, but then it gets very interesting when you get into biotechnology and these other types of areas where there is that intersection. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be done shortly. You know, I'll be done by time. But the intersection of these particular areas and you know, where the line should draw. I've been particularly interested in this you know, uh, limitations on patent law uh, for concerns of, of, of coming into conflict with state law. I mean, one of the other areas where I've written about is on the first sale doctrine and exhaustion. <clears throat> and that's you know, largely a concern in uh, that area where the patent owner may put a licensing restriction saying that you cannot do this with the invention. And then the breach of the licensing restriction, the patent owner argues, is patent infringement. And so the Bowman case is an example of this, um, where the, there's a restriction on the reuse of the seeds. And one of the important policy issues is that, you know, how can the patent owner take a ordinary contract dispute and turn it into patent law? Uh, which has obviously greater damages, federal courts, a whole different panoply. And so that, you know, in part, has to do with the intersection between patent and commercial law. And uh, it really is kind of also a question of how, how much you expand the right of the patent owner in the place of this. So that's part of what I think is interesting to keep in mind as far as natural phenomena, that it's sometimes couched in terms of invention discovery, but it really is about uh, that kind of borderline between federal invention, the federal patent law, and uh, the state law, and so forth. Okay, um, I had another comment about Bowman, but let me just sort of wrap up, and then we can take questions and comments. And uh, they wheeled at lunch, so uh, I don't know. I'm hungry too. Overruled. So. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. I said you're overruled by the lunch. Yeah, I'm overruled by the lunch yeah. center, which is fine. Uh, so since I'm about ten minutes left, I mean, I think I've touched upon a lot of topics and things I could go into in more depth and detail, I'll be glad to do so. Let me talk about this relationship with, with, with Octavius. Because you had the Myriad decision in the middle of June and the Octavius decision a few weeks later. And uh, FTC versus Octavius is a very complicated decision because it had to do with the intersection between food and drug law and patent law. And specifically, it has to do with uh, approval of generic pharmaceuticals by the Food and Drug Administration. And so, in, uh, 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 in the 1980s, Congress created a system to allow early entry of generic drugs. And the problem that arose is you had the, a case called Roche versus Bolar, where the court ruled <coughs> that if a generic drug uh, tried to uh, get approval, safety approval from the FDA and engage in clinical trials uh, of, a drug, of a compound that was under patent, uh, that would be patent infringement. And so Congress uh, responded to this through the Hatch-Waxman Act by creating a regulatory system where the generic drug manufacturers could get approval even when the drug is on, under patent. Uh, and um, they would have to go through a regulatory process that I'll talk about in a minute. But then once they got the approval, the idea would be that once the, the, the drug was off patent, they could immediately enter the market without having to wait another two years for FDA approval. Uh, and so the issue that comes up in the Actavis case is that as part of the generic drug uh, getting approval from the FDA, they have to make some sort of certification about the patent. And so this is where, um, you know, if we look at it just from an institutional regulatory design perspective, there's been a lot of criticism of what Congress did. But what Congress then required is that once the generic drug manufacturer made the certification, 
it opened itself up to a patent infringement suit by the patent owner. And that patent infringement suit then could be the basis to invalidate the patent, uh, could be a basis for licensing, it could be a basis for anything, but the idea was to give the generic owner's rights while also respecting some rights of the patent owners, but also creating kind of a really complicated set of, uh, of legal entitlements here. And so the specific issue here is you have a generic drug manufacturer here, it was uh, uh, Actavis that was, was it, anyway, you had a generic drug manufacturer in this particular case that was trying to make a generic version of androgel, which is artificial testosterone. And so they had a, a, sought approval from the FDA. They were then subject to lawsuit by the patent owner. And in the context of that lawsuit, the generic drug manufacturer and the patent owner reached a settlement. And the nature of the settlement was the generic drug manufacturer would delay entry uh, and the patent owner would pay the generic drug manufacturer uh, to not enter the market. And so this is referred to as the reverse settlement or pay to delay or yeah, pay to delay entry uh, type agreements that was subject to this particular case. And these have been subject to re re review under the competition authorities and under US antitrust law. And uh, before the Supreme Court granted review of this case last year, the lower courts were completely split. There were some folks who argued that these are completely legal under the law, that the generic owner had rights to make some entry and the patent owner had rights and they're just simply negotiating over those rights. And it just happened to be the case that the patent owner pays the alleged infringer, which is the, 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 the description of reverse payment. The other view was that these are per se illegal, that the whole idea behind Hatch-Waxman was to allow competition through entry, and therefore the patent owner paying somebody not to enter the market is inconsistent with competition law. And so the third view is that somewhere in between, as you can imagine that you need to look at these case by case and make a determination as to what the pro-competitive reasons are and the anti-competitive reasons are. So the Supreme Court finally granted review. That was, a, that was a really, and I think they wrote a very interesting opinion. This is probably more interesting than Myriad in my, in my sense. Where Justice Breyer wrote the opinion for, how, how was it, I think it was for, for four signing justices and then Justice Roberts, Scalia, and Thomas were in the dissent. Uh, but Justice Breyer's opinion was said, uh, this is uh, illegal under something called the rule of reason. So again, a case-by-case -case approach. Uh, these types of settlements will be upheld only if they're reasonable from a, comp from a competition perspective. And Justice Breyer went through a fairly long analysis to say why many, many times these types of agreements would be unreasonable. So some people read the opinion to say, rule of reason by name, per se illegal, in effect, but we're still seeing some of their cases after it came us that arise. Why do I mention this now? It's very interesting in the life sciences area uh, in terms of pharmaceuticals, uh, and it may have some implication beyond pharmaceuticals. What I found interesting about this is the debate between uh, Justice Breyer and Justice Roberts. So Justice Roberts in his dissent is basically saying, look, patent law is its own independent autonomous field and competition law is its own independent autonomous field. And the only way in which we find an exception to patent law that competition law is allowed to come in are you know, based upon Supreme Court precedent, cases where there was some fraud of the patent office, where the patent was obtained by deliberate fraud to the patent officer, maybe suppressing novel art, uh, prior art, or something like that. Very few of these fraud cases exist, but in theory, the claim could be brought. And then the other one are situations where there was some sort of, uh, of um, frivolous or vexatious litigation, that the patent owner had no basis for bringing the lawsuit and was just simply using it as a tool to harass. And again, very few cases that are found to fall in that category. So this is Justice Roberts' view, and this is, uh, I wrote about this, and I'll be glad to send the paper. It's very interesting kind of historical roots. You can do an originalist sort of analysis about why that might be the right way. Justice Breyer basically is saying, no, that's never been the rule, first of all. That you know, patent law, in some ways, is an exception to competition policy. And therefore, there are situations where competition policies then should come into play to check what the patent donor does. So I find this case you know, really about patent law I and mean, how, the, how the court views patent law 
and especially with relationship to uh, you know, broader notions of competition. Admittedly, in that type of case, they're looking at a very specific market and a very specific context. And so there's an argument to be made that the Octavius case is just a very, very narrow case that only applies to that particular market and that particular situation. I totally acknowledge that. At the same time, however, there's language that seems to be saying that this is really about the heart of patent law. Right? How are we viewing patent law with relationship to competition law? And I mean, to go back to some points that were raised in other talks, other regulatory systems. Right? I mean, is patent law then autonomous for environmental law? Is patent law, you know, we can make that same kind of, uh, uh, at least theoretical argument in terms of those relationships. So I tie this back to Myriad because when they're looking at the preemption issue, I mean, I think for me the Mayo case was in some ways of the, of the four cases, we can question the reasoning, but from pure policy matter, probably the best put together of those cases. So I try to be very qualified. I'm not saying it's a perfect case, but I do think they engage in the policy issues in a way that were a lot better, certainly than in Myriad. And you have the Octavius case a few weeks later, which shows that the court is willing to engage in this policy analysis, I guess maybe when they have to or when they feel comfortable doing this. But it seems like in the Myriad case, whether they looked at the health issues or the broader preemption issues, uh, instead of focusing narrowly on science, I would have liked to have seen an opinion where they looked at that broader context. And maybe there will be another case, uh, maybe the Sequinon case, the Ariosa case, if it does go up, when they would have the, the opportunity to do so. But to me, Myriad ultimately is a disappointment. And it may be more what the case didn't say that would give rise to further discussion and, and further push both by academics on both sides, both pro-patent and, and those who want to reform the patent system. But that's sort of the, the vision that I have and what I wanted to get across. And, the whole idea of demarcate, de demarcating nature is to somehow naturalize the, pat, the, the court's opinion uh, without really engaging in the broader policy concerns. So thanks. Um, so we're running very close to lunch. Do, does anyone have a burning five minute question to ask? I knew you would, Mark. Go for it. I really have a slightly interrelated couple of questions. Um, just kind of thinking about whether the Myriad decision is a disappointment or a cause for joy. Uh, just yeah. kind of thinking about the, the legal strategies kind of right. employed at the case. So I, mean, I think in some ways I'm really surprised that the Supreme Court of the United States, um, given the composition of its court, should rule against Myriad at all. Um, I, I think the American Civil Liberties Union and the Public Patent yeah. Foundation engage in some very interesting framing of the issues in right, relation right. to the case. So, um, you know, the American Civil Liberties Union kind of portrayed it as an issue of human rights and civil rights and human yeah, yeah. rights. The Public Patent Foundation kind of framed it right, in terms right. of patent reform. Uh, so, so I just wonder. What, what you think about right. about that origin right. is the first part of my question. Yeah. Particularly in Australia, no, okay. we've got yeah. a parallel piece of litigation that right. hasn't really been run yeah. as okay. exceptionally well as, as what happened in the United States. Right. I've just found you a kind of list of cases fascinating in terms of the post-myriad yeah. questions. I, I was familiar with some of them, but not others. I, I, the, Public Patent Foundation have really been trying hard to apply Myriad to other circumstances. Right, right, right. And they kind of got really knocked back by Justice Rader in one yeah. of his last yeah. acts right. on stem cell patents. Right. Yeah. And they got right. knocked out on standing, even though they got yeah, standing good, good, in Myriad. Good, 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 so good. so I, yeah. just, I just wonder whether you'd right. like to kind of think about yeah, the American so Civil Liberties yeah. Union and the Public Patent Yeah, Foundation. good, good, good. So there are lots of questions there. Um, <laughs> and I think from a strategy perspective, I didn't get into the standing issue at all. This is yeah. a question of time. Uh, the standing issue, I think, is the most interesting one. I think under the AIA and uh, looking at the American Vets Act, the Patent Reform Act, I think the, if you look at the language for certain types of administrative uh, procedures, uh, what ex, uh, I was black on the name, uh, uh, post, was it post, uh, was ex parte really, I forget what, what the different procedures are. There's one where you can have immediately after the patent has been granted for a couple of, uh, a couple of months, 
and there's one that you can have uh, after 9.30. No, I can't tell you without my slides. Yeah, no, I can't either right now. Uh, 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 you know, jet lag or something. But, uh, uh, but in any case, I think those rules, if you look at the statute under the AIA, do expand standing, at least in those administrative. That's where I've, I mean, I've always made that claim. And I, it's not clear what the implication would be for judicial. Uh, and there obviously was a standing issue in the, uh, in the Myriad case that the ACLU was the first the litigant, if I remember correctly. Uh, but then, you know, I think, you know, the standing issue uh, in these cases may not be that, at least in the Myriad case, is not that difficult because they were suing yeah. the doctors. And so the Trade Association for Physicians, essentially, that, that organization, would have had standing very readily to bring that case. And, and so that, that was resolved. With the Consumer Watchdog case, I guess, um, I'm blanking on his name. Is David uh, from Red, 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 Red. Pardon me? Ravica? Yeah, Ravica. Right, Ravica. Is it Ravica or Ravica? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've been following that indirectly and indirectly through that. It's just hard for just a general consumer group to have standing to challenge the patent unless you're going to be threatened by the patent itself. Though I think under the administrative rules, which wouldn't apply to the stem cell patents that were issued prior to the, prior to the AIA, I think there would be standing. It's very broad language. I don't remember the language right now, um, but um, it would be very broad language in terms of who would grant standing at the administrative level. And so I think that opens up some very interesting, and in my opinion, some interesting questions in terms of the public interest. Let me just add, I don't know if we can take out the question, of course. You said you were surprised by this court coming out against Myriad, and I'm not surprised because uh, I guess we take the court to be pro, I guess I, I, I'm just reading into your, your surprise that the Roberts Court is somehow pro-business and therefore corporations always win. I think they're pro-free enterprise and I think there is a view that the patent system has been a burden on free enterprise and so I was not as surprised by this. Uh, that, that, that may not be consistent with the Actavis decision uh, but I don't think they, I think part of the problem with the Actavis decision is that they viewed that, uh, that type of litigation in the context of a particular regulatory scheme and Roberts was just simply saying this is consistent with that regulatory scheme, while Justice Breyer read that regulatory scheme to be, you know, pro competition. It's about new entry, and therefore uh, they were led that way. But um, you know, when we look at conservative, we have this discussion about conservative versus what that means in the U.S. Uh, but I think where the the conservatives and the liberals, however they may be described in the U.S., are united is in recognizing that IP does have some impact on the economy, free enterprise. And this is where they do you know, come together in many of these cases. Um, you know, the big exceptions maybe, I guess area is a very interesting one to study in terms of you know, you know, where do the, the fault lines arise in terms of uh, you know, the free enterprise. I think part of it, you know, Scalia you know, comes out in favor of the alleged infringer, uh, largely because of you know, sort of the entrepreneurship and so forth. Justice Roberts, you know, comes out, you know, on the side of, of Breyer, if I remember correctly, if I remember the vote alignments, uh, and it may be simply looking at it in terms of the regulatory structure of cable. So it's a very interesting kind of court because, you know, it's not traditional late 19th century, you know, pro, you know, large corporation. I mean, I'm not denying, and but even in Hobby Lobby, there's just a, it's just a very weird opinion uh, in terms of when you're trying to put it in those labels, I think. And it may be in the future they're just opening the door for larger corporations having, you know, f freedom of religion. That may happen, uh, but that's not what the court was doing in that case. They seem to be very careful to not do that. And I think they are very concerned about free enterprise, and they're also very legal process oriented, and are concerned about their uh, role as a court, right? Uh, and so, you know, in Hobby Lobby, you could read that as a pro comp pro corporate case, or you can read it as Congress created these liberties. And therefore, we're going to follow it. Uh, uh, and again, just just one quick sorry to interrupt, but lunch. I, I think Justice Scalia had the biggest laugh in Hobby Lobby because he wrote the opinion that basically said religious freedoms don't exist or exist very minimally. The Smith case and the RIFRA statute at issue in Hobby Lobby was passed in response to Justice Scalia's opinion, and now Justice Scalia signs on to say, "Okay, Congress, you overruled me. All right, fine, take it. <laughs> this is what you get." <laughs> So the idea is both an economic and an issue for Congress. Yeah, I think that's right, right. I mean, there's, there is this kind of notion about this is a grant from Congress and we need to defer to Congress at the same time recognizing that there, there's a private rights aspect of that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've fully squared that in my mind, 
but that certainly is something that is, if you think about the Roberts Court as one which um, uh, is largely about harmony, much like China, they talk about harmony, the Roberts Court talks about harmony, and they try to find some kind of common ground. And it may be the case that on many issues, at least in regard to IP, that diversions, uh, you know, that variance is not that great as opposed to maybe something like reproductive rights or same-sex marriage or some of these other issues. Yeah, on this, um, um, it's a difficulty to draw the line between, you know, how much human intervention goes into it, natural right. processes to make. Uh, right. It's even more complicated than you said because yeah. there are other cases, aren't there? There's the, you know, there's the uh, Beinecke case, which is, I know, plant patent case, but you always think plant patents, patenting is even more lax, you know, you just right. a little bit of human invention. Right. But then the, it's these oak trees, isn't it? And the, and the, and the uh, it got to the, uh, and the, uh, the board of, uh, the, the um, yeah, CFC followed the uh, the appeals, appeals board by saying that you know that there has to be plant breeding. Um, you know these were newly yeah. sort of newly created uh, seedlings. There was no creating, so therefore there's no plant patent. And then you got this you know, this uh, ditto case. These cats, bred cats, right? And um, so the mixing of wild and and and, uh, and you know domestic cats. Right, right. And this guy says, well, it's a I bet a pure breed. Right, so therefore, you know, it's uh, it, it, it is a, like a human artifact, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, well, the, the court of appeals followed the, the, again the patent book by saying, well, you know, uh, pure breeds happen in nature, you know, right, you know, right. Was, uh, and animals, you know, they happen in nature, and they, they construed pure breed quite broadly. Right, right. So it just wasn't it wasn't yeah. just something done yeah. very sort of scientifically. You know? you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I, mean, I, I want to go into this more depth, in, but I, yeah. and this came under the rubric of invention versus discovery, but. If you go back to the Federal Circuit discussion yeah. in, in the Myriad case itself, yeah. there's a lot of discussion in that case about it's precisely this point, yeah. how much invention And then, is you know, Bowman is right. planting a seed, is making yeah. the and invention. And I think the court, yeah, and yeah we can get into Bowman, and <laughs> yeah. I did have a little so side about it, Bowman <laughs> that I didn't get into, but I, I might yeah. add it here. It's very difficult. Yeah. But, yeah, but I think, yeah. uh, you know, I think maybe one another reason why the court took this kind of, let's hide behind science, is that they didn't want to confront that question. Yeah. I mean, this sort of came up in oral argument. I mean, there's the famous baseball bat question during oral argument in Maryland yeah. where uh, I think Justice Alito was saying, well, if you have a piece of wood, and I use the piece of wood, I'll use a cricket analogy rather than baseball, right? So, okay. you know, use it as a wicket. Uh, is that an invention? Uh, or yeah. do I, you know, how far do I have to go? And I think the court wanted to duck it. I'm not sure why. I mean, I guess it would be interesting to see if Justice Sandra Day O'Connor had been on this panel mm. uh, because of the Feist decision. Right, I'd be really interested to see how she would have handled that case or handled that question. Because that's precisely the open question or the big question in Feist, right? How much creativity is necessary? And I see that same analogous question that comes up in Myriad. And I think the Federal Circuit and these other circuit cases that you mentioned. Yeah. And I think it might continue, especially since the court does adopt, certainly in the, in the Alice case, this notion of inventive concept. Yeah and how that's going to intersect with natural phenomena, and I think it's sort of an open question. Isn't that, doesn't that sound a bit German, the idea <laughs> of the inventive concept? I'm not sure about it. It's the way I was pronouncing it, I don't know. But uh, uh, the inventive concept, well, yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, I think, um, I'm not sure exactly what it means it sounds German, but uh, one, uh, just uh, certainly, was, sort of certainly I think people view Feist as, as somewhere else. Fe Feist is uh, Justice O'Connor channeling Hegel, mm -hmm. and kind of a personality theory of copyright rather than a Lockean theory of copyright. That's what's so fun about teaching fights to the US. Is that also so it's, it's not really yeah. a Lockean case. Sorry, yeah, I mean, always thought so compared to Europe, so US patent law is a bit less airy fairy. So bringing in sort of inventive concept to me sounds a little bit yeah, sort of like yeah. uh, right. we've always had the yeah. we've always had the principle that was always floating around. I mean, that's right, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and, and I mean I, Right, it used to be a lot bigger, the principle. Yeah. Which inventive concept sounds like we're going back there. It also sounds like we're going back to Flash of Genius a little bit, too. There. Yeah, right, right. This is the Feist, right? Yeah, that's, that was my reference to Feist, yeah. Uh, when you said, I guess it would be interesting to go back historically and see how inventive concept had been used. Of course, Europe right. also has this a problem-solution thing, which is right, why right. Feist is quite pragmatic. Yeah, I wonder if I'll get through this pair, but I mean, I have a student, um, a graduate student at Wisconsin who's visiting from Belgium, and she's written about subject matter at the EPO. And so we were thinking of trying to write about something together post Alice. Uh, because I, mean, I guess the European Patent Office talks about a technical effect. Yeah. And now it seems like the analogy in Alice is a technical application. Oh, bringing in technical right, now. Technical that's, that's, 
That's what I mean. Getting more confusing. Yeah, bringing in technical now from Europe isn't. Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to be more conceptual, trying to understand what yeah. Alice means. Yeah. You know, in a global context. I don't.